last part. Okay. Okay, well, you really have made uh, um, almost no mistakes. You almost got it right. So uh, let's see here. We've got here, um, so what type of reactions are going to happen here? How do you know it's going to be SN1 and E1? Because we have um, a third degree car uh, tertiary, alpha, good. tertiary alpha, car alpha carbon, and we have a, a core nucleophile. Yeah, neutral oxygen. Yes. Okay. All right, so uh, surprise, we're doing an SN1, E1. Okay. Um, so you start with the SN1 uh, reaction here, leaving group leaves, and then the nucleophile attacks. Uh, so that went great, just a minor technicality. Um, all right, maybe I'm, even I'm being too picky here. However, as a minor technicality, you, uh, I don't think people draw hydrogens bonded like this, because it makes it look like the hydrogen is bonded to this hydrogen. So TAs or instructors can be picky about this. You really have to draw it like this. We have to put this hydrogen. You have to basically. You got to break apart the two hydrogens okay. to draw this in the conventional manner. That's a technicality, but it's good to see the conventional way of drawing that. Right. Okay. So then you ended up with this. All right. But you definitely got the exact right products there. So let's see what happens in the E2. I'm sorry, the E1. Okay. Now um, the first step of E1 is the same as before. The leaving group leaves. I was uh, even lazy. I didn't even draw it again. I just said it's the same okay. step as before. So you have the same step as before. Um, now um, the only problem here is they didn't put in the charges. Remember, the most important part of the picture is the charges. What's the charge that I, that's left out here? A positive. Because this was at, uh, because this alpha carbon was at the initial tail over here. So it's crucial to put the charge in every picture. Again, those are the most important part of any picture. So right. part of our uh, regimen here is to get into the habit of drawing those in. And then we also have the negative charge on the bromide. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but you know, other than that charge, your arrows were perfect. You drew exactly what was going to happen. So um, I, I think you were looking at your slogans. We know that um, what happens in elimination is leaving group leaves, pi bond forms, and beta hydrogen gets stolen. Well, we've already had the leaving group leave. So the only two things left to have happen are beta hydrogen gets stolen and pi bond forms. And these are the exact arrows that you drew. So you drew the exact right arrows. Maybe just leaving the charge out might have made it hard to see what, happened, uh, what was going to happen here next. But those are the exact right arrows here. Um, we've already had the leaving group leave, so the last two things that have to happen now are beta hydrogen is stolen and pi bond forms. Incidentally, I think you labeled the beta carbons. That was good. Yes. Notice again, there was three beta carbons here, but they're all equivalent. So it doesn't matter which beta carbon you choose. Uh, you can choose any of the three beta carbons. Uh, I noticed that you made a notation that this was a secondary beta carbon. That's true. It actually has no relevance to this problem, so we don't need to bother putting that in. Okay, so now we can go ahead and draw the intermediates. Okay, well let's use our step-by-step -step technique. So I'm going to go ahead and number all the carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. All right, and now this is one of the most important things we can go over today. Remember that um, the arrows are supposed, to make, uh, are supposed to make it clear what the product is. So there must be something we're not understanding about the arrows if uh, we're having difficulties. Let's go through the step-by-step -step technique and see how the arrows are telling us what to do. Well, I'm going to start with the number one carbon. Mm -hmm. Who is the number one carbon attached to? To so the number two carbon. All right. Is the number one attached to anybody else? Um, no. No. But we have to uh, make sure that we're listing all the bonds that each atom is making, all the sigma and all the pi bonds. Well, the number one just has the sigma bond to the number two. Of course, the number one has bonds to hidden hydrogens, but we usually don't show those. But we have to mention all the sigma and pi bonds, except maybe to the hidden hydrogens. Okay. All right, so who is the number two connected to? It's a, it has a, um, a sigma bond and a pi bond with uh, number three, correct? Okay, good. How do we know that it has a sigma bond to the number three? Because it started with one. And how do we know that it has a pi bond to the number three? Well, the arrows tell us so. The arrows tell us where to put in the bond. So this arrow here is telling us to form a pi bond over here. That might have been the trickiest part for you right there. All right, but let's continue on with our step-by-step -step approach. Who, uh, and it's good that when I asked you who was the number two attached to, you didn't just say, oh, it's attached to the number three. Instead, you said, oh, it has a sigma and a pi bond to the number three. We want to be as precise as possible about who we're attached to and by what types of bonds. Now, who is the number three attached to? All right. And to the number six. 
Good. Yeah, we can't say, say number four. We also have to say number six. Um, you might have started by drawing the number six down here, because that's what it looks like over here. But then you'd want to uh, adjust that, because this wouldn't be a 120 degree bond angle. When we're forming a double bond, we want to form that 120 bond angle. So I'll start to draw this like a regular double bond here, with the number six pointing out here. All right. Okay. Um, who's the number four attached to? It's the number five. And that's it. And who's the number six attached to? All right, and now I think that we've successfully drawn the product here. Okay, so that's our product. Um, and any other products from this step? Um, yes, well, the uh, negative uh, bromide ion. Although that was a product from a previous step. Sure. That'll still be floating around. Anybody else? Um, no. Uh, let's see, maybe you've already got it drawn. Did you draw the hydronium? Oh, oh yeah, the hydronium. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's the important product from this step. Yep. Okay, so it would be best to draw that as well. By the way, it was good that you didn't use the bromide to take the beta hydrogen. We usually want to use uh, whoever was the nucleophile for the SN1, it's conventional to use that as the base for the E1 over here. So the bromide doesn't play any more role in this particular reaction. It just goes floating away. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't, get, uh, you wouldn't get any HBr at all? Oh, well, you know, you probably get a mix. Um, you wouldn't be expected to draw that. There, there's kind of a technicality here. HBr is actually a strong acid. Mm -hmm. In, in solution, it would be completely deprotonated. Okay. Um, however, uh, maybe I shouldn't even mention that, because actually, even though this would be completely deprotonated, usually in solution, actually, oftentimes, we do show HBr being formed. Sometimes it's convenient to show the HBr being formed. But that would not be the conventional <coughs> thing to show here. Right. The conventional thing is to show the, uh, the water, the thing that we used as the nucleophile for SN1, we're using that as the base for the E1. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not conventional to show any HBr. And uh, actually, as a, as a matter of actual chemical fact, we probably would not form HBr because HBr is a strong acid and wants to be deprotonated. Okay. okay, so that would give us uh, these products uh, over here. All right, now again, um, I just wanted to emphasize again, so when you looked at the table, it said SN1E1. Uh, and now again, very often, if you're doing a, a problem in your textbook, they're only gonna draw the SN1 product okay. because the E1 is only about 5%. On the other hand, if they say all possible products, maybe they want both the SN1 and the E1. So you have to pay attention to how the problem is worded to see whether to draw just the SN1, here is our SN1 product, or also the E1 that we had uh, down here. A couple of other technicalities. Is this a stereocenter? So is there one product or two from the SN1? Yeah, but we always have to check um, uh, for that. Okay, so um, we went through the E1 here again. So you got the arrows correctly. Um, one thing that gave you difficulty um, was uh, forming this pi bond over here. And this is more important than just E1. Maybe the most important thing we went over today is how to use numbering and the atom by atom process to get the right product. Because this doesn't just work for SN1 and E1, it works for any mechanism you'll see in the whole course. Once you have been given the electron pushing arrows, you should be able to draw the exact right product no matter how complicated and unfamiliar it is. However, you can't do that in one fell swoop. Instead, you need to number the atoms and then just go one atom at a time. Ask, who is the number one attached to? Who is the number two attached to? Who is the number three attached to? And you want to make sure that you're drawing all of the sigma and pi bonds that any atom has. And then it doesn't matter how unfamiliar the reaction is, the arrows tell us exactly what uh, to draw. This is one of the biggest issues in the course. Most students never really learn how to use the arrows this way. And then the course gets harder and harder for them because they don't know how to draw the right products. So this is actually maybe the most important thing we talked about, just numbering and then going atom by atom.